Hi, everyone. Uh, my, as a, thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction. My name is Arun Venkatraman. I'm one of the founding engineers here at Aurora and lead of the behavior planning team within the motion planning team. I'm joined here by my colleague, Sanjaban Chowdhury, who's a senior staff engineer also on the motion planning team. So let's get started. Let's talk about imitation learning and forecasting. It's only a game. At Aurora, our mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. We believe with our multimodal sensing capabilities with LIDARs, cameras, and radars, including our state-of-the-art in-house built first light LIDAR, with the intelligence we're building in the Aurora driver, we're able to build a product that lets us deliver goods to the customers that need them and give a comfortable ride to the passengers that request it. Our AI technologies work across our various vehicle platforms, be it from classic trucks like the Peterbilt you see here to the Toyota Sienna shown driving here down the highway in this rendering. Across Texas, our, our customers are using our trucks to help deliver goods where they need them, when they need them. Next slide. So what does it take to build a system that can do this? So like any other robotics system um, that many of you might be familiar with, there are three main components at least. Of course, there's many more, as I talked about just hardware and there's definitely controls and various other parts that we need to talk about. But there's three maybe primary components we think about when we talk about building an autonomous vehicle. The three ones are perception, forecasting and motion planning. In perception, our goal is to get state estimation. We want to understand where the vehicle is as well as what are things around it. In forecasting, we want to be able to predict the evolution of the world. We want to know what is happening around us and how that will look like in the future. And finally, in motion planning or decision-making, we want to know how to find the best action given both of those things that we've talked about so far. So you go to the next slide. This is what we would call making a classic autonomous vehicle. We can draw some arrows between our components and show a cascaded system that goes from perception or state estimation down into forecasting or predicting the evolution of the world and finally into motion planning or the decision-making side, which is finding the best action. Next slide. So we think about this from a machine learning point of view, which is kind of our focus gonna be in this talk is what do each of these components look like? So on the perception side, we're pretty familiar with this. This looks a lot like single shot prediction models. We have a giant uh, convolution neural network or something like this, and we use it to go from the large set of inputs, the LIDARs, the cameras, and the radars, this giant um, uh, multimodal model into predicting where things are in the world. Into the next component, forecasting. Here, we are also familiar with this sort of concept. We might use something like a recurrent prediction model instead to understand how that state evolves over time. It's not a single shot prediction. We don't ask it to don't necessarily just do it at one time, so we want to understand how this thing would evolve over time. And then finally, from a machine learning perspective for motion planning, we think of this usually in the, in the sense of imitation or reinforcement learning models. While we might use either single shot or recurrent models to do this, we often phrase it with the sort of frameworks in mind. Next slide. So we wanna first take a deep dive into this forecasting component and understand a little bit about it before bubbling up again and asking how does this really fit into the bigger picture? And that'll set the stage uh, for, for our, our conversation. So, what has been really awesome in the past, past few years is seeing the rise of these transformer models. It's really an exciting time to be in sequence modeling and recurrent prediction. Very different than when I was starting my PhD and doing this work. Here we can see that there's so many different places where we've seen really expert level of quality from the models we've built so far. By fusing the, viewing the machine learning problem is really kind of acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of connection as we do sequence predictions and we need to connect and transform all the inputs and connect them to each other to get a very accurate prediction through time. For example, GPT-3, everyone's heard of this. This is state of the art. We have BERT, we have Gato. Now we have the new DALI model that's just producing excellent pictures for us to, to, to enjoy. Um, yeah, so naturally this has not been just um, in the other parts of the ML literature, but also sort of cascading down into self-driving and robotics in general. We're seeing it taking over a lot of the forecasting problems where we have sequences of states. We wanna encode them in a way that then connects all the dots together and then predicts out spits out to us what the futures would look like, where everything evolves relative to each other. And there's a variety of papers here on this topic, and they're really, really excellent, showing the, the power of using these sort of very rich sequence models in order to accomplish the tasks that are important for us in robotics. Next slide. So if we go back to our diagram, making a classic autonomous vehicle, there are three main components. And when, we, when people mostly talk about this, there's a clear connection between the first two. We go from perception, we have these, we have these inputs that we then want to feed into forecasting. So it's very easy for us to think of the back propagation here of saying, okay, well, the forecasts are wrong because the inputs are wrong. Therefore, I need to make my perception system better. Um, and from an online pers system perspective, this makes sense. We want to say, okay, we can't do any future work for the thing with the upstream component. And that's usually where a lot of the discussion sits. And, at, and even at Aurora, we have some prior work with, uh, with our colleagues on talking about how this propagation should work. But if you go to the next slide, 
there's another interesting divide I want to draw here, which is what is the contract between these different subsystems and how do they really play into the robot that we're building? So on the left-hand side, we talk about the past, what has been. And then on the right-hand side, we're actually talking about the future, what could be. And by drawing this contrast, we can actually see that the problem we need to focus on now understanding is how does the downstream component of decision-making or motion planning play with the concept of forecasting? And I know the past and the future, this kind of reminds me of Christmas Carol, um, but yes, definitely the ghost of future, future past is here. Next slide. So this leads us to the, the first topic of our discussion here, which is the fog of decision-making and forecasting. Next slide. The story here is not as clear when we think about the future. How does forecasting and decision-making play with each other? What is currently considered the uh, well-known literature on how to do this? So in perception and, and, and state estimation, this is actually well-known at this point. We know that we can train these amazing uh, machine learning, deep learning models to produce very accurate predictions of what I'm seeing in the world. We're able to do sensor fusion very easily now and able to achieve this at very high quality. But what does it mean for the forecasting and motion planning layers? How do these play together? And part of the reasons is that these data sets don't really acknowledge the fact that the system, the downstream component of motion planning is so dependent on the forecasting problem. How do these two parts work together in harmony? But there's hope. This is being acknowledged through the literature as well as of course at, at companies like Aurora where we need to use our learnings that we're seeing as we try to approach from the motion planning side and sort of back propagate the lessons as it were into the upstream component. Next slide. So we're gonna break this down in terms of three core lessons. The lesson one is conditioning on the AV's decisions. So here's an example of one of our class A trucks that Peter built running down the highways in, in around Dallas. So we can see here that it's approaching a merge and there's many actors or vehicles that are on the emerging lane. The vehicle here must understand what are the futures of the world that could happen and what action should it take? Clearly I can't take the average of all such actions because that would possibly result in something like a collision, but instead I want to be in one of the clear options for the future. We can, we can think about this from a human perspective, right? And if you go to the next slide, there's a couple options. I can take two modes of behavior. I can take one mode, which is I want to yield to the actor that's on the merging lane and go safely and slot behind them. Or mode B, which I want to understand that I can go in front of the actor. And in both of these, the important thing is that the behavior of the actor, while we could model it as a multimode distribution, that joint distribution is actually conditional on one more aspect. It's conditioned on the fact that the AV has agency. The AV can choose its action and that results in a, in a very coherent future of the world. So for example, in this diagram, this cartoon here is in mode A, if the AV or autonomous vehicle yields to the actor, this results in a specific future. This results in a future where the other actor will speed up to try to resolve, resolve the situation in the merging lane. Or in mode B, where we decide to go ahead of the actor. By showing our intent very clearly in the decision-making process, we're able to induce a probabilistic distribution for the future where the actor will slow down for us. So often what we want to see here is that the modes of the future are dependent on the AV's actions, which are not part of the observational distribution since the AV has agency over this. Um, finally, an interesting point here to note is that when we try to learn this stuff from data, we also have to handle one more problem, which is that the counterfactual forecasts are unobserved, but they're important to modeling our futures. And this is a observation made in a few different papers as well, but we really need to understand the fact that we only get one sample of the world. So if you look at that example that I showed in the previous slide, you'd only get one example of how that scene was traversed if we were to get it from data. But however, we want to make our system capable of extrapolating into the counterfactual. What if another thing had happened? What if the AV took a different action? How would the world have evolved? So that's lesson number one. Let's move on to lesson number two, the right metrics for the right forecasts. Uh, forecasts are never going to be perfect. All machine learning models have some amount of epsilon error. We know this. There's never a free lunch. But they need to be good enough for us to actually do work with them. So one problem is if you do something simple like taking an L2 loss on just the trajectory metrics, looking at the distance between waypoints or something like this, we won't quite get the right answer to understand, is it important? And this is a, a problem that's now being acknowledged in quite uh, a few places in the literature at least. Um, for example, in the B-lines work by Skanda Shri, they're here on the left, we might want to understand the system is not symmetric. For example, there are some sort of prediction failures that are going to be related to comfort. Yeah, I predicted something incorrectly, but it only resulted in you know, a little bit more braking or an action that was not quite optimal for the robot. Or something could result in a safety failure. The prediction actually has consequences to how we are taking this. It's also addressed in uh, Mark Pavone's work and uh, here shown on the right with the diagram. Also understanding the, the influence that these forecasts have into type of actions that we might want to take next. Lesson number three. The last one is a very interesting one, which is that Part of the forecasting system's job is to help the motion planning system hedge against rare events. 
And this is kind of a problem if you think about it in isolation where forecasting becomes a probabilistic modeling event. In miles and miles and miles of data, but our understanding of really rare events, very minuscule in this. So given a specific learn, learning model or model class, it's gonna be very hard for that model to really emphasize these really rare events at the trade of improving accuracy. Let's go back to that L2 loss, improving L2 loss in the most common circumstances. And how do you really model this? Well, one might say, let's go model as a probabilistic problem. Well, this again is really quite challenging because what is it to the learner to get one thing a little bit right versus wrong? Whereas on the counter side, if we look at it from the AV's perspective, a little bit of connection back to lesson number one and conditioning on the AV's actions, is that when you observe driving data, especially human driving data, it's very easy to see that the human is in fact doing something a little strange, not just avoiding the most nominal of a future for the actor. They're not saying that, oh, this vehicle is likely to going to go, or this pedestrian is just gonna follow the sidewalk. You might see them showing guarding behaviors or hedging against some rare event that's about to happen. And this kind of gives us more sampling of this rare space by connecting the forecasting problem, understanding the probabilistic distribution of actors with the actions the vehicle is going to take, since that is something we can also get lots of observations on. What is the autonomous vehicle or ego going to likely do in the situation? Next slide. So connecting these three lessons together is really important. And to do so, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague Sanjaman to talk about, about if, is there a unifying framework to reason about this connection between forecasting and decision-making? Take it away. Thanks, Arun. Um, so yeah, as Arun mentioned, you know, the, the, the story is not so clear. So let's you know, now take a step back and clean the slate and ask ourselves a question, which is, can we build a single unified framework to reason about forecasting and decision-making? What makes an optimal forecast and plans? To answer this, we go to the basics. Um, you know, our one true goal is to imitate human driving. We want to drive like the expert Aurora driver. Um, we want to produce trajectories that match what the human do. And to do this, we realize that forecasting and planning are simply means to producing such trajectories. Okay, uh, that's good, but what does it really mean to imitate? Um, you know, there's oftentimes a misconception about imitation learning that imitating a human means doing exactly what the human did, producing the exact steering angles and, 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 and brakes. And, and that's simply not true. For example, uh, you know, if you look at the scene where uh, the AV must out of lane nudged for a parked vehicle sticking out, um, precisely replicating the steering angles and brake profiles may be tricky for a number of reasons. For instance, even an expert human driver certainly doesn't do just one thing. There can be a lot of variance in how the human out of lane nudges. Uh, sometimes a human violates the boundary by a lot. Sometimes they come close to the parked car. So what aspects of human driving should we be matching? An alternate and uh, more achievable objective is to match certain statistics of human driving. So more formally, we want to match moment, uh, moments or future expectations of human trajectories. So, so you know, pretend you can draw a bunch of samples, Xi star from human driving. Uh, we want to define a set of moment functions, F Xi star, and go match that. And this is by no means a new idea. This traces back to work by Abil, Aying, and Zibart. Um, and so let's try to apply this thinking to our particular, our current framework of out of lane nudging scenario. What are the moments we may want to match? Well, one obvious moment is the amount of control effort exerted by the human. So the average acceleration or jerk. Another moment might be the proximity of the AV to the parked car. So we don't want to come closer than the human does. Another might be the average amount of boundary violation. So it stands to reason that if the learner generates trajectories that matches these moments, we should be human-like, even though the trajectories may visually appear very different. Okay, so how do we solve this moment matching optimization problem? A powerful way to frame this problem is as a game. Uh, the game is played between two players, a generator and a discriminator. The generator begins by proposing trajectories. The discriminator then penalizes the learner for not matching moments of the human. The learner then updates trajectories and the game continues. A formal way to capture this is an IPM game. IPM stands for Integral Probability Metric and is an increasingly common way 
to measure um, divergences between two distributions. Uh, the nice thing about IPM is that the, the class of discriminators is linear. So you get really nice performance guarantees. So total variation, Washerstein, these are all examples of IPMs. So in this IPM game, uh, you have two players. The max is over the space of moment functions and the min is over trajectory distributions. Now, there are some considerations on you know, how to solve this game uh, when strong duality holds uh, and so on. Uh, for that, we refer the reader to Swami et al. For now, we'll just think of running um, a simple no regret algorithm on the discriminator and the best response algorithm on the uh, inner uh, learner player. Uh, and if you do this, you sort of reach epsilon equilibrium and, and solve the game. Okay, so how does thinking about this IPM game, game help us uh, solve the uh, out of lane nudging scenario we just saw, right? So think of the space of um, discriminator functions containing all the moment functions we just talked about, like the amount of control effort, proximity, boundary violations. The discriminator combines these functions to create a cost, right? So let's say the learner proposes the following trajectory that slams on the brake. You know, if the discriminator puts all the weight on the control effort function, it can penalize the learner. If on the other hand, the learner decides to whiz past the parked car, the discriminator can choose to put all the weight on the proximity moment. And finally, if the learner chooses to swing all the way over to the oncoming lane, the discriminator can, can put all the weight on the boundary violation. So you can see that the learner will finally be able to achieve equilibrium by um, more or less uh, trying to match the human on all three of these respects. And uh, you know, once the epsilon equilibrium is reached, the game is solved. So um, this gives us a really simple, practically useful, interpretable recipe for solving imitation learning. And the, um, the cool thing is that this framework isn't just one algorithm, but captures an entire family of imitation learning algorithms that fall into one of three categories based on how you choose your starting state for the human or the learner. And you have off policy methods where the starting state is where the human visits, or you can do on policy methods where you roll out the learner and see where, what states they visit. Or you can even have an interactive experts that show the learner how to recover from states the learner visits. Um, so, it's nice to have this unifying framework that allows us to combine feedback from all three regimes, uh, which is exciting. Okay, good, but I still haven't told you how forecasting fits into this story. So to do that, let's take a deeper look. Um, this time, let's look at the example of a merge similar to what Arun showed earlier. Um, so we see here, uh, you have the human driver yielding for a merging vehicle we would like our learner to produce a similar trajectory. How do we go about doing that? So let's bring in what we just learned. Let's bring in the IPM game we, we developed. We know that one of the moments we want to match is control effort. We don't want to break more than the human. But interestingly, another moment that we can introduce is to stay behind the actor that's merging in. And to compute where the actor will be at any given time, we need a forecast. So forecast um, really help define moment functions. Um, and, and so if we, uh, if we uh, take a look at how this game plays out, we'll see that um, you know, when the learner generates a trajectory that accelerates, um, it'll collide with the forecast and the discriminator uh, will assign a really high cost to the learner. If the learner slams on the brakes, of course, the discriminator will choose to put all the weight on the control effort and the learner gets a high uh, penalty. But, but if the learner slows down while staying behind the forecast, it'll reach an approximate equilibrium of the game. So it's interesting that forecasts, as, as Arun was mentioning before, forecasts don't need to be perfect. They only need to be good enough to help the learner match the human cost. So by that logic, forecasts don't actually always have to correspond to what actors did in the future, right? Uh, take a look at this example. Uh, we have the human uh, in this example, lane changing, uh, because it thinks that the part, this parked car might pull out into its lane. In reality, this parked car does not pull out at this very instant. Um, 
what would happen if you were to apply the IPM game in this situation? Well, um, if the learner were to generate a trajectory that drives past the parked car, um, it would get no penalty because uh, suppose you had a forecast that exactly replicated what this parked car did in the future, you would have, the discriminator would have no moment functions to penalize the learner for, for doing this motion. Um, instead, suppose we hallucinate a forecast. For instance, say we hallucinated a forecast that this parked car pulls into our lane. Now, if you look at the learner trajectory, it looks pretty high cost because it collides with the active trajectory. On the other hand, if the learner lane changes before the parked car, um, then it too reaches a similar cost to that of the human. So we can think of forecasts as being more than predicting what will happen in the future. They can also predict uh, rare events uh, which, for which humans happen to be guarding against. Okay, so we went through a lot. Let's once for the last time wipe the slate clean and build up ideas one by one. So let's say uh, we saw the following data point uh, where we have a self-driving uh, truck uh, following a particular motion that looks like a lane change and a passenger car sort of driving straight and sticking to its lane, right? So we saw this data point, we would like to drive down the loss on this data point. So the simplest thing we could do is to forecast a single trajectory and minimize L2 error. Now clearly uh, everyone here knows that that won't really work because um, it can be pretty hard to do exactly what, uh, replicate ex the ex exact observed motion, right? So that's not a good idea. The, the next logical step is to say, let's produce multiple trajectories for each actor such that at least one of them minimizes the L2 error. Um, and this captures the fact that the uncertainty is multimodal and you know, this helps us do one step better. Maybe we get the forecast for the, for the passenger car correct, but we still don't, this, is, this still doesn't help us get the forecast for the truck correct. But, um, but if we just switch out the L2 error with the IPM metric we just talked about, we can see that um, the, uh, the IPM, the, the discriminator could hallucinate a forecast of what other actors could do. And ergo incentivize producing trajectories that, that lane change just like uh, what the human did uh, in, in the data point, right? So, so it's nice that you know, out of this framework, this, this hedging behavior uh, falls out pretty naturally. Okay, so now let's take a quick look at some real world examples to see how we may apply these ideas. Uh, here's an urban example of the AV taking an unpredicted left turn at an intersection with vehicles, by cyclists and pedestrians. You know, there's a lot going on here, uh, but, but let's break it down. You know, we see that um, the AV's actions depend on what other actors in the scene are doing. For example, you know, we need to yield for the vehicle turning right, as well as pedestrians crossing the intersection. Moreover, there's an oncoming car that is waiting on the AV to determine when it can do its own unpredicted left, right? So this is a scene where there's a lot of joint interaction happening between actors. Our approach, in our approach, we abstract away this scene by defining a graph neural network over all actors where we treat each actor as a node in a graph, including the AV. Uh, the edges of the graph capture relationship between pairs of actors. And this graph neural network is nice in that it allows us to enforce structure between which actors in the scene affect each other's motions. And so this is a really high level uh, glimpse of our approach. Um, uh, essentially, we, the input to the graph neural network are, are node features for each actor and edge features. We then encode these uh, features and do rounds of message passing where forecasts are passed between each actor. And finally, we decode these uh, as uh, interactions between actors and the, uh, and, and the forecast for each actor. And the, the, the IPM loss that we talked about uh, would fit in very naturally as, as the loss we evaluate on, on the forecast. Um, so this is just to go back to the merges, uh, merge problem that we started this discussion with. Um, we, uh, you know, we see that this is a situation where we're negotiating an, a merge with other actors and we're trying to find a slot in a stream of traffic. Um, and again, in this scene, we can apply this sort of graph neural network approach to reason about all active forecasts. Um, 
And then by using this, this sort of interactive reasoning, uh, our truck chooses to slow down and merge behind the first two vehicles while the third vehicle makes room and merges in behind as expected. Okay. Um, okay, so the exciting thing here is that, you know, this is a production model that is running on the road all the time. Um, every day it gets tested hundreds of miles on the road and millions of miles of simulation. Um, you know, this, is, this model is key for the robot to understand humans on the road and the more miles it gets, the better it, uh, the better it gets. So with that, we are at an end. Uh, we talked about how we can view imitation learning and forecasting as one big IPM game. Uh, the forecasts help define moment functions that discriminate between the learner trajectories and the AV trajectories. And looping back to the lessons Arun talked about, we now see that the framework offers a singular way to think about all of these lessons. Uh, namely, that the forecasts depend on the AV's decision, that they're ultimately a means to help the discriminator discriminate between the learner and the human. And while it's great, we have a clear framework to build, out, uh, build off of, there's still many practical challenges uh, to integrating forecasting and decision-making that we didn't get to talk about. For example, how do we choose moment functions? Um, how do we um, combine off policy and on policy and interactive uh, feedback? Um, and how do we make everything work in production? Um, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge all our wonderful uh, team members at Aurora, our collaborators in CMU, and with and yeah, with that, we'd love some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the audience? So one question is coming. Uh, thank you for your presentation, great presentation. Um, you started with your slide at one point, the rays of transformer, uh, but then I <laughs> kind of missed how you use it in, uh, in the rest of the presentation. Can you talk about the connection between the motivation of using transformer and the rest? Because at the end, even you, you use graph ne conventional network or, so I missed the motivation of the transformer. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. I, I guess, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the you know, really, uh, if we can just think of Transformer as uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the essence of Transformer as being a way to sort of uh, evaluate attentions, so to, un to understand how we, you know, given, um, you know, how, how we capture relevance of one act of actors with each other. And, uh, you know, graph neural network is simply a way to, 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 to enforce some structure between what actors we think interact with each other and what actors uh, we think we don't. So, I mean, uh, not to over-index too much on the difference between the two, but um, I, would view, um, I would view Transformer as being an aggregation mechanism that can live happily inside a graph neural network. Uh, so, so, and and th th these are things that we experiment with uh, uh, at Aurora. Um, so, you know, for instance, if you, look at a, if you look at a scene in the road, you could go ahead and make every actor pay attention to every other actor, or you could use some prior knowledge to sort of partition which actors are relevant to each other. And, and, and you know, this partitioning sort of helps your model um, uh, learn with fewer amount of data and, and, and kind of uh, be a little bit more interpretable. But that's probably, um, that's probably the, the link between the two, yeah. Like maybe to add to that a little bit, like one can effectively achieve uh, both with each other in some sense by thinking about masking the attention layers inside of a transformer network. And when you mask, if you put a engineered or a, a, like a prior wave, a prior model on that intention vector and multiply the two probabilities together, we're just saying that in some cases there's like a one zero encoding of that prior vector that can make the in both training and inference faster, right? So part of it also is that we need to be able to run our models at, a, at the appropriate frequency on the vehicle. And to do that, sometimes reducing that model structure can help with that as well. So um, just wanted to add on a little bit there. Thanks. Thanks. Um, there is actually a question from the chat. Um, I just read it aloud. Um, what exactly do you condition the predictions on? The planned trajectory of the autonomous vehicle or some kind of uh, high level decision? I think that's a great question. Um, 
I think there's a limit to how much we're, we're supposed to completely talk about here, but both aspects of them are actually really important to making sure the model has a joint reasoning and understanding of this. Um, I know that's kind of well, sidelining a little bit on the question, but I, uh, there's probably a limit to how much I can, I can expose in this, in this conversation right now. But, but I think both ideas are very good ideas is what I would say. Thanks. There's one other question from the audience. Uh, I have a question. So um, in your slides, it's like uh, the autonomous uh, vehicle can uh, already make some decision when there are two lines like start merges. However, I think like, for example, when we're driving, some, um, a lot of times my decision was also impacted by the car next to me. So if I saw like it's slowing down, so I may like accelerate. If I say like uh, it accelerates, I will slow it down to yield it. So like uh, my question is, uh, if your vehicle is like um, continuously changing, uh, changes policy or it's like steep into one policy, uh, policy, for example, if there are two lines purchase, it always try to yield the car uh, next to it. You got my question? I think I missed some of the key words in that question. Uh, do, do you mind trying to rephrase it? Yeah, uh, so my question is like, um, for example, if there are two line merges, uh, if the car's policy is like, it is always trying to yield the car next to it, or, it try, or its policy is like always changing, like depends on the other car's uh, actions. Yeah, I can, do you want, do you want to take it sometime or should I? Okay. Okay, yeah, so our vehicle is continuously at, at a high frequency trying to uh, establish what the world is doing around it and how what action it should take relative to that. So it's not always choosing to yield to the actors. Like in the example Sanjaban showed, as, we, as the scene evolves, the vehicle gets more and more you know, certain in a sense of that the first two actors, like if it takes an action that isn't somewhat assertive a little bit, like the right amount of assertiveness, it's able to actually slot between two actors rather than have to wait for everyone to go, go in front. I don't know if that quite answered your question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think there's another question in the chat. Yeah, I can, I can take that. Yeah, um, go the, ahead. the question is, do you include information um, of the HD map in your scene representation as an addition to the actor graph? If so, how? The answer is yes. Uh, we, we do include uh, HD map information. Um, uh, without going too much into specifics of the how, you can imagine that um, when we when we are reasoning about uh, features of every actor, uh, we would we would we would reason about sort of you know its feature with respect to this to this map. When we are reasoning about features that capture pairs of actor relationships, uh, we are obviously reasoning about sort of um, you know how far away these actors are with respect to the the, the roadways on the map. So um, so I think the the, the HD map definitely plays a uh, a pretty significant role in, in how we featureize actors and actor-actor and -actor relationships. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I uh, think there are no more questions from you. So thank you again for the very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for having us.